business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for All About Android is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Ford. Ford invites us tech geeks to join the conversation, submit ideas, and grab a tech geek badge at social.ford.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of All About Android. This is uh, episode 72. It's recorded on Tuesday, August 14th, and we are your source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I am Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards, back in the studio. Yeah. Yes, I'm nice. Back. I've returned. Feels good to have everybody in the studio. It does, Just a little yeah. bit of extra energy exactly. here when that happens. We are not joined today by Eileen. Unfortunately, she decided uh, to start her vacation early at the airport. Why aren't you Skyping in from the airport on your way to your vacation, I question Eileen? the dedication. I really yeah, do. You know? totally. Yeah, totally. She's no. going to hear this. She's going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> you guys, you guys it was told okay. me not to do that. <laughs> no, we, we gave her a pass. She's on a yes. much deserved vacation. I'm very very jealous uh, that she is going to go get some time off. So. As far as I'm uh, concerned, when you're on your way to uh, your vacation and you're at the airport, yeah. you're on your vacation. Yeah, exactly. Like, don't do that. Don't it's, Skype in from there. Especially when the Wi-Fi expires every 30 minutes. Yeah, that's another uh, <laughs> trick. Uh, so we have uh, joining us today, Father Robert Balliser. You uh, are no stranger to the Twit Network these days. You're all over the place with This Week in Enterprise Tech. and I am. I'm kind of... A- Glomming on to Twit. I mean, come on, this is an Uber Geek Nirvana. Who wouldn't want to be here? Are you kidding me? <laughs> one of us, one of us. Well, no, boss. <laughs> By the way, for, for the purpose of the show, I believe I'm. The chat room says I'm going to be called not Eileen. So I'm Father Not Eileen. All right. Okay. Okay. That, that'll be that hard works. for me to remember. <laughs> But it's I'll, uh, much easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what does Father Not Eileen think? <laughs> well, I will attempt to try and uh, follow those rules, but I have a feeling I'm going to fail miserably. He's already showed us up with the with the tablet stand. I'm very I know. Impressed. That's yeah. one thing about yeah. Father Robert. If you yeah. haven't seen him on other shows, he's got all sorts of gadgets, gadgets. and tricks up yeah. his sleeve. I'm sure we're going to hear all about him today. Very cool. uh, this week, we're going to be discussing, among other things, uh, Motorola's plans to, you know, kind of get fit and slim down a little bit. Uh, the death of Flash of and on Android, actually, is nigh. And side effects of DRM. Plus, we have three free apps in our arena segment towards the end of the episode. But that's all, you know, later. Right now, we got to get into some news. Let's do that. Do it. Let's do it. Okay, so fine. Let's check in on the patent case of <sighs> Century, you know, Samsung versus Apple. I'll admit it. I'm, uh, I'm just excited. kind of exhausted no, trying to follow this. No, you're excited. I can tell. Earlier, you are like, you know, we've got some more legal stuff to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? I don't know. Like, like I realize the, the importance of this trial and everything, but sure. following it on a daily basis and trying to, like, summarize that, on a weekly basis, it's so difficult. There's so much stuff coming out of this, and it's all kind of mi- minutia. You it's, know? it's legal exhaustion. I think everyone yeah. has taken their position. You've got yeah. the uh, you know, Apple fanboys on this side. You've got the Android fanboys on that side. Then you've got the geeks who are just saying, when will it be over? Yeah. Right. And just tell me what the outcome yeah. is. And if you've had any experience in following any legal proceedings, whether it's technology-based or any sort of thing, l- legal equals slow and like yeah. meticulous and detailed. And there's some briefs and all these things like that. And you know, and it's it's it, so it's hard to get momentum yeah. <laughs> in that coverage until so until see, you yeah. until you start getting you know rulings and you start getting some real reactions. Okay, totally. now what does this mean? Totally. Yeah. Well, I'll do my best to uh, at least give you a few uh, points that I thought were interesting. Judge Lucy Co. ruled that the international Galaxy S, the Galaxy S2, and the Galaxy Ace are no longer part of the trial. And later, Samsung tried to get the case tossed out, claiming that Apple wasn't doing a very good job presenting their case. Not surprisingly, Judge Lucy Co. denied that request. I think she actually kind of berated both sides at that point, just yeah. kind of saying, look, you guys need to get this together. Um, and if you are keeping score, that still leaves 17 Samsung devices as part of the case. So three of those out really doesn't change a whole lot as far as that's concerned. Progress, though. It's yeah, at least I, we're I guess whittling so. down. Sure. <laughs> yeah, whittling it down, making it easier to understand. But, but this is not. like the old school of business negotiation where you ask for something so outlandish yeah, sure. and yeah. then you, you will it down. But I mean, 
you're not supposed to do that in a legal case. You're supposed to present the best possible case you have, not say, well, we're going to ask for 20 phones. We really only think three infringe. Well, well but but mm. it, but is it, though, in a legal case? Because it's the kind of thing where it's like, listen, we want to get as much as we can, so we're going to throw everything but the kitchen sink at this judge. And if they walked in going three, they might get two of them thrown out or one of them thrown out. It might just boil down to one. So go with, you know, go with, I mean, the legal minds that at corporations are part of the, whether it's for the betterment or the worst, or the worst of, of the experience, they will work every loophole and every angle. And so I'm not surprised Absolutely. at all that they're, that they're yeah. doing this. You know, and I, and I would expect shenanigans like this on both sides. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, look at the. I mean, it's not a technology thing, but look at the progressive case that that blew up yesterday with that guy. You know, like the legal shenanigans that went on there with that insurance company was crazy. And these are these, you know, big law firms that figure out how to work the system. And so, you know, Apple and Samsung, they're both going to be guilty of it. So. Well, the thing is, I mean, with so many parts of the case shedding as we go along, yeah. it, there's so much ground for an appeal. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, mm. it, it, that's, I think that's the other yeah, reason why, I, even though I, I'm very passionate about how this shows how our patent system is, is messed up, I can't get excited about this because I know even when we do get a decision, that's the start of the process. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. You spent the last month leading up right. to the beginning of the process. Right. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. kind of depressing right there. I've uh, I've kind of appreciated today how you're not the, the only person I've heard uh, have the word shenanigans oh. ar around it's, this case. I like that shenanigans is, is kind of seeing a resurgence right it's now. It's a handy word. Yeah, well, it really it sums certainly up, works. Yeah, it sums up some legal shenanigans. <laughs> Get a broom. Uh, <laughs> now, Apple has wrapped up the defense of their claims. And starting today, Samsung began their own lengthy, as we we can imagine presentation of their counterclaims. They've tried to call Apple's patents into doubt by showcasing what they believe to be prior art in both Pocket PC's launch tile and Diamond Touch, which is a multi-touch tablecloth. I put that in quotes because it's not really a tablecloth, <laughs> but it kind of gets you to open your eyes a little bit calling it that. Uh, that exhibited bounce back images back in 2003, which is something that Apple's saying, you know, Samsung is kind of in the wrong for having any sort of bounce back. So I don't think these things were necessarily Samsung's, but they exhibit that uh, kind of behavior and hopefully bolster their their side. Again, throwing everything but the kitchen sink. They're going to yeah. look at everything that That's was out there do. that has been like, and, say, and they're going to say, well, if Apple's suing us, why didn't they sue them? And, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. So. Well, I mean, they tried to throw in the clip from 2000, the space yeah. odyssey of, yeah. you know, him using what looks right. like a tablet. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that's kind it's all that prior art. And so I, I, I feel for, for Lucy Coe because... There's just there, there's all these these elements coming in that she must be going. Are you are you people serious? Are you yeah. perfect? Do you know what you're doing? Why are you, why is this making it to my bench? Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, she is uh, kind of hitting her point as well. She's actually said that she wants the trial to conclude uh, with the closing arguments starting next Tuesday. So if that <laughs> happens on next episode yep. when we talk about this, we can talk about that part and maybe not talk about it. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, yeah, should be, if, actually, honestly, Chad might need to get his trigger figure ready because that might be some breaking news that, when that happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If we get You'll have to remember that for there. next week. Yeah. Well, not now. You, well, see, you yeah. say the words breaking news and you need to be prepared for it to happen at any moment. But, so, Chad, that was a good practice. I like, we'll be I ready. like that you were so quick with yeah. that, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being awesome, as always. That's premature bumper us. <laughs> <laughs> premature breaking news. Oh, that's excellent. Well, what is the one thing that is as dramatic and exciting as a legal case for us to talk about? Numbers. Numbers. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Those are fantastic. So um, some excitement from the Gartner Group today is they released their report on mobile sales in Q2 2012. And honestly, things are looking pretty good for Android. It's got 64% of the market, followed by iOS with a distant 18% market share. Um, one of the big reasons for this is Samsung. Um, which just you know has been a powerhouse this year, rolling out phones and the big Samsung S3 launch. Um, you know, leading into that, although Q2, I wonder how much those those um, the S uh, the S3 sales probably didn't really affect because it came out later in Q2. But yeah, yeah who knows? But either way, it. Samsung's a big a big reason reason why. Um, if you look at the vendor list that Gartner released, 27 percent of the market share is uh, uh, to Samsung, and it surpassed Nokia, who had 20 percent, and iOS with 7 percent. So Android's living pretty large when you look at the marketplace. I mean, you know, again, lots of manufacturers, lots of openness, lots of product out there. People are buying it. Uh, it's really gaining traction. Yeah. So. Well, what I like about this is it's simplifying an argument that people have always had with iOS versus Android. And that is, oh, well, there's only three iOS phones, but, you know, there's a thousand Android phones. Yep. 
Well, we've got one manufacturer right now who is kicking the snot out of Apple in terms of sales. Not only that, you can really narrow it down to maybe three or four of their models yeah. that comprise most of their sales. So uh, we're really starting to get to an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, if you put these products next to each other, the the average person is more likely to, t to take the Android phone. Right. Apples mm -hmm. to apples, pun intended. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, of course. But um, yeah, no, I mean, and it's interesting too because it's it's so. I mean, especially and it, we always we always have to you know we navigate very closely to the Android versus Apple, the iOS versus everyone else, the Apple fanboys, kind of you know that kind of fight, right. that kind of you know pick a side. Yeah, but it's um, difficult but if, to avoid that. It's very <laughs> difficult to avoid that. But it's but it's really interesting because we you know we live you know like every day we're existing in this very technology filled kind of uh, field. You know, we, I'm lucky to live in San Francisco and have a lot of friends who work in technology and it's iOS, iOS, iOS. And you get a false sense of what the rest of the world looks like. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's funny because I go, you know, I just was in last week when I was on the show, I was in New York and I was in New York City and Long Island and seeing family and friends and I saw a lot more Android phones than yeah. iPhones back out there. Absolutely. You know, because, because those devices are more affordable. Um, you know, like it's, it's less, for whatever reason, why the average person would select a non-Apple device. Um, There's so. just a a lot more of them, uh, you know, on the shelves. Yeah, even yeah. you know, I, iOS and iPhone and, and all that might be the one that you've heard about a lot. But when they go into a store and they see a store that's filled to the brim with all of these Android devices, and then over there's the iPhone cor corner right. yeah. where they know that the devices are going to be probably more expensive and whatever. Yeah, it's the same for me. I mean, I just got back from from Boise for the for the weekend visiting family and saw a lot of Android phones. I do when yeah. I go traveling. I see a lot of Android. A lot phones. of Galaxy Notes. Yeah, <laughs> surprisingly. In the wild. Yeah. In the wild. Yeah. Now, you know, actually, one of the things that surprised me was I, I, on the way to work, I walk to work uh, to, in D.C. every day, yeah. and I pass a Sprint store, a Verizon store, an AT&T store, and a T-Mobile store. And it always used to be, well, we've got the iPhone, and, yeah. you know, they have it up front. They're changing their displays. The iPhones yeah. are still there, but the ones that are getting prominence are like the Galaxy S3 and the yeah. Galaxy Note. Um, and I mean, they wouldn't do that unless they're selling those phones, right? Mm -hmm. And I th and I think it also speaks to the maturity of the Android product. Is finally, that is that right. is that finally you know after being an early myself being an early adopter, getting the G one on the first day I could, and like saying, okay, I I sense this. This is going to be something cool. What was that three years ago now? And now yeah. it's at the point now where you know my sister has an Android phone, and you know my sister who you know listens to Barry Manilow and does, does isn't really technical. <gasps> yeah, exactly. Barry Manilow fans. She, exactly. <laughs> she she has an Android phone and is you know we. We were, you know, she was out and about using apps left and right, showing me, oh, you should, you should review this app on your mm -hmm, show, and like mm -hmm. that says something about the platform and the, about sure. the software that the developers are creating and the devices the phones are making. And so I think these kind of reports, you know, say what you will about numbers and say what you will about market, you know, industry analysts and things like that. It's a, it's a refreshing breath of okay, this is what the rest of the world looks like, and let's get, you know, this is a wake up call. Let's get out of our little bubble and realize that actually there's some momentum here right. with this product line. Yeah. So. Hey, Ron, you, you know, uh, Samsung's feeling the Android love, but you know who's not feeling that Android love? Ooh. Motorola. Yeah. So Motorola has been unprofitable 14 out of their last 16 quarters. Yeah, they're they're cutting 4,000 jobs with about 13 of 1,300 of those happening in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, they're also reducing the number of models that they're going to be uh, well pushing forward. They had, I believe, 27 smartphones in 2011 and 2012. They're, they're going to cut that down to just a handful. And I'm hoping it means that it's going to be the higher end ones because yep. that's really what people are looking for for Motorola. I mean, yeah. they, they make some nice some nice that, gear. That that uh, Razer Max phone, I right. recommend that to someone. When somebody asks me, okay, what phone should I get? I always say, what carrier do you have? And if they say Verizon, I say, you should check out the Razer Max. It's a, it's a nice little phone. So mm -hmm. yeah. Now, a nice little subtext to the story is, uh, I know there are a lot of people who think this is what was going to happen all along. You know, mm -hmm. Google just bought Motorola for the big patent war chest, and they're getting rid of the actual maker of phones. But um, this could actually be a good thing. I mean, if they can narrow it down to a couple of phones, if they can focus on design and, and actually taking what they've done well and, and pushing that in front of the people, then maybe they could become profitable again in, you know, five years. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely curious to see how this happens and how this impacts the whole Google acquisition and, uh, or the, what the – I'm still curious to see what that acquisition is going to yield. Right. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So I, I think the acid test for me will be next year at I.O., if it's a Motorola phone that they're giving out to the attendees yep. that tells you that, okay, Google wants to keep them around. If, if it's still a partner, 
then Google saying, look, we're not really invested in Motorola one way or another. It could die and it wouldn't really affect us. Yeah. Do you think that they go backwards on kind of their promise where, when they say, well, we're not going to give preferential anything to Motorola? I mean, you, you, people will say that. But yeah. I mean, it, it's, not that they're, it's not that they didn't give preferential treatment to Motorola because obviously they are in, in letting them restructure. Mm -hmm. It's that they're saying, if you're not going to make good products, we're not going to prop you up. Yeah. And yeah. Fair goodbye. enough. I can't imagine laying out what they laid out to purchase it that, that it doesn't become a key part of their strategy. And I think mm -hmm. I think it's just too early to see. And I think honestly, I mean, it's it's always horrible when people lose lose their jobs. And I would hate to see four thousand people, you know, not not get employment anymore. But they're gonna. I mean, this is kind of typical. Google acquires it. They're gonna pare down. They're gonna focus on what they need to, and then they're gonna build back up. Mm -hmm. Right. Now. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor for today's episode, Ford. Now, uh, Leo and Ayaz actually spoke with one of Ford's lead technologists, this is Jim Bukowski, about his views on the future of technology and vehicles. And some of the topics that were kind of on the table for that discussion, uh, things like categories of apps that, that are coming to the Sync platform, kind of cool location-based services, finding friends, financial service apps, all that type of stuff on the go. Lane departure warning and lane centering features using onboard cameras using the cloud, uh, which is kind of a big deal if you haven't heard these days, to seamlessly connect information and services used in the home, vehicle, and office to make that a lot more uh, convenient. Ford Social is one of the ways to develop and surface those ideas for the engineering team. Uh, Ford Social is basically a place where people are going to uh, go to post ideas that they have to Ford. Now, you can go to social.ford.com, and you can take a look at a lot of these ideas that are being posted to the site. Uh, there's a lot of really cool ideas being put, put up there. Wi-Fi music sharing between Fords, uh, biodiesel hybrid, and that was actually submitted by a 15-year-old, uh, automatic sunscreens, just a lot of different ways that uh, technology uh, can be kind of implemented into the Ford vehicles and uh, kind of see where they go. Wind turbine under the hood to charge a lithium <laughs> battery. That's cool. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Uh, as a tech geek, Ford wants to hear your ideas as well. And they invite you to join the conversation. So you can do that by going to social.ford.com. You can read all about it there, submit your ideas to Ford, and you can even like your favorite ideas. Um, while you're there, be sure to grab a tech geek badge. Uh, everybody's doing the badges these days. So is Ford here. You can get your own tech geek badge. You can also read a blog post that actually our Leo Laporte, uh, uh, submitted about his discussion with Jim Bukowski. That's all. That's at uh, social.ford.com. And that's where you go to check out all this stuff. We thank Ford so much for their support of All About Android and just the Twit Network in general. It's awesome having you guys with us. All right, let's get into the hardware section. All right. Well, speaking of Motorola. Oh, yes. Speaking of, you know, asking you shall receive. <laughs> speaking um, of hero devices. <laughs> uh, the Motorola Photon Q 4G LTE is up for pre-order. It's going to be available on Sprint on August 19th for just $200. So if you are a Motorola fanboy and you're looking for a new phone, the new hotness is the Photon Q. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, <laughs> The Photon Q 4G LTE. TE, yeah, exactly. The names. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That, that, that's just, yeah, that's <laughs> just driving me crazy. Yeah. But... Um, uh, but it's it's an interesting phone because it looks like it's got a QWERTY keyboard um, uh, and it's got a 1.5 uh, gigahertz dual core processor, ice cream sandwich, 8 megapixel rear facing camera. Um, looks to be like a nice little phone for $200. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. There. Also, we've got uh, Barnes & Noble cutting the price on their Nook. So you can now pick up a Nook reader for $150 and the Nook Color tablets for 180 and 200 for the 8 and 16 gigabyte versions. Now, one of the things that people are saying is they're clearing out inventory, getting yeah. ready for a new Yeah, one. what's going on here? Are they trying to stay competitive or exactly. are they getting ready for something new? Exactly. And we mm -hmm. all know why they're doing that. It's because of this thing. So oh, I think so. Yeah. You've got the Nexus 7 breathing down their throat. And even though the Nook can still say, look, we're primarily a reader rather than a tablet. Uh, I think uh, we can safely say that, yeah, they, they're feeling the heat. Well, yeah, and and I think that I mean the the Nook is a nice it's a nice tablet. It is. I mean it's you know once they you know when they rolled out the Android ones that can run apps and things like that. I don't know how successful. I haven't seen any numbers on how their app sales have been and that sort of thing. But I believe it continues to be fairly a fairly success for them. So you got to believe that they're clearing an inventory to roll out the holiday kind of the the next model, the next generation. And I'm curious to see what it looks like. I still think that it's. 
Um, say what you will about the Barnes & Noble infrastructure and the layer. I still think it's the the, the most uniquely designed bezel, the most uniquely designed piece of hardware yeah, that sure. really has an identity. It absolutely so, has yeah. its own identity. Yeah. I think what's interesting here, and in, in just listening to you talk, this kind of popped in my head, is is the distinction between a a reader that does tablet-like things and a fully-fledged tablet that's a 7-inch device. What's, what's kind of cool in this case is that the Nexus 7 has come along and, you know, for, for whatever reasons... People look at it differently than they looked at the Nook or that yep. they, than they looked at the Kindle Fire. Even though you know, by you know, under the hood, you know, obviously there's there's a lot of really good hardware in the Seven, but under the hood, they should be able to do much, many, most, if not all, of the same things. It should but be there all. was this distinction yeah. Yeah. of no, well, that's actually the reason it's it's less expensive and the reason that it's low spec is because it's a reader that does some tablet like things. Well, now they're forced mm-hmm. almost right. to kind of meet Google at their game with the. Seven, yeah. and they're all you know going to have to come up with something that's reasonably comparable. And I don't think they can hide behind the oh well, it's just a reader that does a little bit more type excuse anymore. It has to be a tablet. Well, at, yeah. the, at the very minimum, they need to open up the Nook to the Android store, yeah. the marketplace. Yeah. It has to be in there. If you're not doing that, it's it's DOA. The, mm-hmm. the cl- yeah, the closed system on there does potentially hurt them because Barnes and Noble just doesn't have the infrastructure or the right. or the massive ability to support something like this that Amazon that Google has or even Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, going back to what we're saying about Android phones in the wild and people, you know. You know the average Joe who who shop, buys his books at Barnes and Noble and 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 I'm, I always pick on the Midwest and I don't mean to so I didn't I held back but in <laughs> kind of some <laughs> other town that I don't live in or have ever lived in um my well, you know might be like hey I want a tablet and we, you know Barnes and Noble's treated me right this far so I'm going to stick with it so it's curious <laughs> to see I wonder how much of that momentum can keep them rolling with this with this product. sure uh, how yeah. did you do that how did you make the apology become the insult oh, <laughs> that, right. that was that was I'm, awesome I'm <laughs> from New York. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how it goes. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, now, Sony actually announced their plans, uh, if you've been following the Gamescom conference, uh, for PlayStation Mobile. It's something that they actually announced first at E3 this year. It's an initiative that they say will bring what they call bite-sized games for PlayStation-certified Android devices. It's kind of cool because those games... Well, first of all, if they're if they're purchased through their store, they're tied to your PlayStation Network IDs, and that's yep. for like cross device gaming things. But they've also announced that ASUS, ASUS, and WikiPad are PlayStation certified vendors. And I guess what what I kind of like about this is just that there can be PlayStation certified vendors now. It's kind of like what we've talked about on the show in the past about like being Nexus certified or yep. whatever. You know, it brings a not that that even exists, but in this case, it does for PlayStation that a hardware you know manufacturer can kind of become certified for PlayStation access. Now, I guess that begs the question, like, does it really matter? Because has PlayStation on Android really been that big of a deal so far? No, but it, could it be? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, so you, you've got on one hand, you've got Sony who's got PlayStation and is this juggernaut PlayStation network and say what you will about security and whether your account is safe and all that sort of mm-hmm. thing. But, you know, it is one of the two main kind of ga- uh, gaming platforms. But then on the other hand, you have Sony. They've got Android tablets. They've got Android phones. They're making a commitment to the Android platform. So at some point, those roads might uh, might converge. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, what we get out of it could be pretty darn interesting, and this could be the beginning of it. That's right. Sure. I think this is actually – you're going to see this from Microsoft very soon when yeah. we get the Surface tablets out because – the, the the manufacturers of game consoles are realizing, look, we it's always been a losing game to make hardware. We've, we've known that. It's always a lost leader. And we make it back on the games. Well, the hardware in a tablet like this is now approaching the, the level at which we can make competent gaming on these systems. Yeah. And if we can get them to license certain key technologies from us, you know, we can get a piece of a huge pie. Yep. Uh, I, I think, you know, you, you've got PlayStation doing this. You've, you've already got Microsoft kind of doing it with Live because Live is available on so many different devices. Mm-hmm. You're going to see it from Nintendo as soon as they have another, you know, revolution. Iteration. They, they, like every 15 years or so, Nintendo kind of eats itself and then gets reborn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what I think is interesting, though, is that is that uh, in iOS and also a lot of Android, it's been, it's been trailblazing for independent game developers. Um, so what you've got is you've got a lot of, you know, because it's a different platform, it's a little, you know, not easier, but just not as hard to break into, you know, many, not, many, not as many hoops to go through. Um, but when you've got Sony, PlayStation, those big studios starting to develop things for sure. so PlayStation Android devices, when Microsoft Surface comes out and it inevitably links up to mm-hmm. Xbox Live, and, and even though Xbox Live, ha, you know, the, has a lot of indie developers on there, but I mean... 
you know, I, it's going to get the competition is going to get a little even tougher. The games are going to get much better, and the independent developers are, you know, it's going to have to be even sharper in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, hopefully that breeds innovation. I mean, that's typically what happens. Right. And so, like, I think we'll get some good things out of it. But it could be a completely different landscape in about a year or two from now, was when it comes to gaming, especially with tablets. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Stuart. Whitfield actually emailed us, aaa at twit.tv, with something that kind of ties into what we're talking about here, because one of my, you know, one of one of my frustrations with gaming on on you know these devices, touchscreen yeah. only devices primarily, uh, can sometimes just be the control of it. You know, it's not always the the most fun kind of um, kind of format to really interact with versus having like a controller. Uh, Stuart says, I've only just caught up watching episode 71 tonight, a week behind. This is maybe a little old, but hopefully still of interest. In the arena, uh, Jason reviewed the 6-axis controller app. I, too, have my 6-axis controller hooked up to my Galaxy S2. I use it to play all sorts of games, uh, and he lists uh, lists a bunch of them that you can actually do with that, Air Attack HD, Pew Pew, Temple Run. Uh, touch emulation is very powerful. Although this app works perfectly, I find it difficult to play using the controller since holding the controller leaves no hands free to hold the phone. So I'm always balancing it on my lap. Obviously, this is a common problem since I have come across this accessory. And I had heard about this and I'd completely forgotten about it. It's called the Game Clip. And it actually allows you to clip your uh, your phone, in this case, cool. to... Your cool. your controller oh, no. might not be the most beautiful thing in the world. But like that it's, is functional. I was, if you're but a it's geek, functional. That is beautiful. Okay, yeah, I'm right. Sorry. Like it, it does the trick. So if you've got your six axis uh, app running on there and you're controlling the game, you don't have to really worry about where you put the phone now. <laughs> Just clips right into your controller and it becomes a portable gaming uh, system complete with controller. Now the, talk about Android in the wild. You find me a photo of somebody using that yeah. on the subway, <laughs> and I will buy you a cookie even better <laughs> you get me a video of someone yes. using that and yeah. then running into traffic right and, yeah, like, and then you will get a cookie like right. me and song pop <laughs> that's right. there you go be careful with your game yeah that's a dangerous <laughs> cookie right yeah. there <laughs> uh so that is uh the game clip spelled with a k dot com you can check it out if you want to pick up that's one of those it's kind of cool that's super cool i mean that's clever and, <laughs> and i'll give them credit even you know what little what little stumbling in the world of marketing that i've done in my career those are some good taglines it's like you know simple just gaming you know secure because i'd worry about the phone falling out and things yeah like that. it looks like they you know, they got it this is smart yeah it's pretty sweet it's funny <laughs> so there you go uh check that out thank you Stuart, for sending that in all right let's get to our apps So tomorrow, Adobe will be disabling new installs of Flash on Android. So uh, I guess Flash dies officially. Do we, do we have some? Do we have some sort of graphic for like uh, death or a graveyard or you know like the you know the the, the horn you know the, the, the yeah exactly yeah. wow that's a big yeah. deal now see they the, said they were going to do this there's a backstory to this that a lot of people come. haven't heard and that is Adobe was actually on the oh. <laughs> Now I'm just tearing <laughs> up. <laughs> what is that? It's okay. I'm sorry. I don't Flash. know, but it's piano. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to live, man? Live. <laughs> Clear. <laughs> See the light. No, but I mean, Adobe was ready to kill Flash. That's they, true. they really were. Actually, a couple of years ago, because they realized it's kind of buggy and it's always yeah. going to be resource hoggish. But then when Apple came out with that, well, I'm sorry, when Steve Jobs came out with Flash Must Die, they were they were caught, caught in a quandary because they couldn't seem as if they were bending to Jobs. Right. So they actually extended support for Flash years beyond what it would have it, it would have died in its natural death. Mm. So I think this is finally Adobe saying, okay, we want to get rid of this. We would like you to move on to our next generation platform. Uh, we're all go. Please forget the Flash experience and forget that we created it yeah I, I i'm really curious about what this is going to mean to for air and um other apps that have been developed u- utilizing air on android because i know that there is a albeit small but a decent sector of developers who built on the air platform and then and then and leverage it out to android or the so are they going to left in the cold you know, I mean, it'll it's it's new installs. So that's the important thing to know. Yeah. So if you have, it's not like Flash is all of a sudden suddenly going to die on your phone and not work. But. And I'm pretty positive that even once they're not offering it through the Play Store, I have to imagine if it isn't already, right. it's going to be pretty easy to find that APK and install it. You're you know, going to find a way to sideload side, it, side load yeah. it yourself. Um, it is just kind of it's an interesting chicken and egg 
in reverse scenario because it's kind of like you do you get rid of it now and then hope that you know all these sites that still depend on it kind of change their ways or do you wait and I, I don't know it, it's hard to say because so many sites still do for better or for worse they still you know rely less, less and less though every day i mean of every, course as you're browsing out there with the rise of h you know how you know how bullish on html5 i've been and the rise of html5 has really kind of helped to shepherd out flash out of our development kind of collective uh spirit which is i just you know applaud because flash has been a, a thorn in my side since like the mid 2000s so I, i'm not shedding yeah. a tear over losing flash. I, I've, I've made that crossover i yeah. used to be in the yeah okay flash sucks but it's on all those sites I need to visit. Right. right. It's become so buggy recently. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. It's crashing so often that I, I finally shifted over to yeah, I'll, I'll be good to see. It'll be great to see it die. You, you know what? You know what's really interesting though, which is uh, completely, I mean, which cracks me up and totally a non sec or not related to this. But um, Gmail mm. uses Flash in ways you don't even detect. The attach file, a file attachment, at least on Chrome on the Mac, mm -hmm. that's Flash, because Flash will crash and I can't. I can still write an email, but I can't attach a file. Oh, interesting. Yeah, really fascinating. There will, there will to be see a how, lot of yeah. sites. Exactly. Like little that. things Tiny like little that. little flash yeah. hooks exactly. mm -hmm. that no one knew about until yep. suddenly you, you get weird yep. functionality problems. Yep. But, I mean, it's going to get to a point where it's just the restaurant websites that have flash. Right. And <laughs> Those pesky restaurant websites, why don't they step into the How hard is HTML it? Just give, me a, future. give me an open table form, <sighs> give me a PDF menu, and I am done. Like, yeah. do not, I don't need to see your restaurant and your music. And I guess that's why, that's why I kind of lamented a little bit. I understand exactly what you're talking about, yeah. and, you know, I'm, I'm fine to see, you know, every, everybody kind of moving to whatever the next thing is. Right. But, if you can still, why not? You know what I mean? But, you know, I, I'm sure Adobe, from their perspective, they don't want to continue to put something out that they no longer support yep. because then that's going to be a black eye for them when they don't support it, when it's not working for a number of people. So I, I understand both sides. And, to, just, keep, and to keep There's, it, there's to enough keep reason the, to keep it around. The version updating to make sure it works with every OS yeah. as fast as we're updating the OSs yeah. these days. Yeah, I mean, I mean having said that, though, since I've been on Jelly Bean, you know, I only use Chrome as my browser, and right. it doesn't have Flash, and yeah. I really don't find myself needing Flash. There might be an every once in a while where I go to a site and it doesn't load the way I expect it to, but it's not a, you know, it's not a deal breaker. I had that for about the first week using the Nexus Seven with Jelly Bean, and mm -hmm. then it was like, oh yeah, it doesn't have Flash. Okay, well, there's another way to do it. Something right. happened where my Nexus Seven, where I went to install Flash, and I was like, I can't install, I can't install Flash on here, and I can't remember what the application was. But it was, there was an application where I'm like, I needed Flash on the Nexus 7. I was disappointed I couldn't get it. Hmm. And I can't. There the you moment. go. Yeah. See? Yeah. Oh, there you go. But uh, it's hardly an argument to keep supporting know, Flash. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. right. And there are ways uh, to still pull up Flash. So don't worry about it. You can still get it if you want. Adobe's just not going to be giving it to you directly. Uh, so Jelly Bean introduced app encryption. We remember this from uh, when we heard all about Jelly Bean for the first time. That was to protect paid apps and developers from getting ripped off uh, from piracy, basically. Uh, cue the sad trombone, although I'm pretty sure that there is no sad trombone. So it's okay, Chad, if you don't have it. As uh, that <laughs> DRM actually makes many developers' apps unusable uh, with... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> With uh, how it stores information critical to their apps, they disappear from the device once it's rebooted. Essentially, these paid apps were being installed into an encrypted folder that was wiped with a reboot. And, you know, that's the that's in an effort to protect the apps. Instead, yeah. it's actually making those paid apps not work. Google has since disabled the security feature, so they're kind of taking a look at it to kind of rejigger it a little bit. Yet another case of DRM wreaking havoc on those that abide by the rules, uh, which is kind of a bummer. Although, ultimately, yes, that, that does suck. I'm okay with the fact that, that you know, this is there. I know that a lot of developers were really happy to see that there was some sort of encryption kind of tied into uh, Jelly Bean to protect their apps. So Just got to get it right. They'll and get it right. I mean, this is, this, if anything, this is just lights a fire under their butts to get it to get sure. it right. Yeah, you know, that's so. Mm -hmm. But, um, but so in the um, hey wow, this is cool file. Um, Google has uplate, um, updated, updated uh, the tr uh, the Android app for Google Translate to version two point five, and it includes some very cool new functionality: the ability to translate text from images. Yeah, we were talking about Word Lens, this right? Is kind of yeah. a free way to do. 
part of that. Quite interesting. So now if you are in, oh, I don't know, France and you see a street sign, you can just take a picture of the street sign and, and it will translate the, the street sign itself and tell you what it, what it means. So there's... Uh, you're going to try to translate gonna, the desk. I'm going to... No, well, I'm just <laughs> trying to show it, right? I got to, like, prop this right, up no, so that I can... So we're going to translate uh, office screen. Okay, well, this isn't working. There so let go. me just take it. I'll take the picture of the sign. Okay, now you can show it, Chad. Um, okay, so there's the sign right there. So basically you take a picture of the sign, right? And the bottom part of it is in Spanish. Let's see, Spanish to English. So then I highlight the part I want to translate, and it says, permit parking only. Pretty cool. You that take, that is so cool. It does it Very like immediately. Cool. And what's even cooler is you can change what language you want to translate it to. Yes. So let's change it to Arabic, and it will give it to us in Arabic. Oh, yeah, I can totally read that. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. See, um, that's exactly what I meant to say. Yeah, we or can what, look what at the it sign in, says. maybe I want to know what it is in Dutch. What does it look like in, ah. There you go. Yes. To, toll late in parking only. <laughs> this is um, the killer app for Google Glasses. It's, if you built yeah, this right? into Google Glasses, oh my goodness. That's yes. hypothetically if Google Glasses that's work. That's if it actually yeah, exists. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but what's even, um, and they, they couldn't just stop there. They couldn't just stop with, with the uh, image tr uh, translation. But they also added instant translation results while typing. To the app, so as you, so when you select your dialect and start typing, what's going to happen? It's instantly translating what you're what you want to translate, which is the 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 move towards Google Instant results continues to fascinate me. How they can actually think ahead of you and I, I want to see how that works though, because some languages the context is very yeah. specific. I mean, depending on words that are at the beginning of the sentence, it will change words at the end and vice versa. Yeah. So, well, we'll see. Yeah, it'll we'll see. see it. And also, they also added support for multiple characters um, at once for Japanese handwriting, which is interesting as well, which I wouldn't know how to demo in the first place. Oh, yeah. But, so, um, Chad, actually, you can show this and yep. it shows it as I go uh, here. Well, maybe if, it, if it'll be big enough for you here. But hello and welcome to... Ooh. That's so that's cool. cool. Underground... I Layer. Layer. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> You're underground layer or layer? Uh, layer. <laughs> Dang it. I, well, whatever. So, layer. <laughs> there we that's go. That's cool. You see, this is a category This is a category of Google doing cool stuff. And, that's, yeah. yeah. Hola y bienvenidos a mi guarida subterránea. Subterránea. There you go. Yeah, I, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> there uh, we go. So, stay away from Jason's underground yes, layer. That's right. If you feel the need to translate things and you want to translate uh, signs and images and things like that, you can get it now. Uh, Google Translate is uh, version 2.5 is available in the Google Play Store. So go download it now. I know some folks in the chat room were saying, how can I get this? Just go download it. It's, it's free. It. Google nope. wants you to have it. They want you to have the information. Take it. Take their stuff. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. All right. So on to another email. Um, this one's a little, uh, <gasps> little wordy. So we're going to dive right yeah, into it. Yeah. Could... It's all good. And I just Juan, I could summarize it. But... No, it's okay. Um, so uh, Rami Katan writes in and says, uh, greetings, AAA team. I'm a listener of your show since episode one, and I love it. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Without you, we are nothing. Um, Rami says, true. I'm an Android user since about uh, a year and a half now, and I love my Android experience, but there was always a missing feature that I wanted. Get notifications when some applications get updated for these reasons. There's an app that I want to purchase, but the price is a bit high. I want to wait until the app is on sale. For many reasons, it happens quite frequently on Android apps, then buy it. I like the game, but I finished all the levels, and the developer promised to add some extra levels. I want to free up some space on my device till the game gets an update, then download it when the new levels are released. That's a fair reason. Absolutely. With Google Play auto update feature enabled, I miss most app updates. The Play Market will update them silently, and I discover it was updated days later. That's a good one right That's there, too. That's a very good one. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I don't turn on auto update, actually. Yeah. So uh, Rami said, I looked around but found no app or service that can send me notifications when an app gets updated. So being a software developer, I developed a service myself and provided it to everybody on the web, and I called it AppFeed. Uh, you, so everybody can find uh, Rami's project at appfeed.net. Um, very cool. That yeah. you just I, I love I love I love the I want something so I'm gonna <laughs> it's go not build there it. so I'm gonna build it that's how great things are created right that's somebody fantastic. has a great idea yeah. it's like why can't I find this and turns out it's a great idea yeah so um, it's re really cool you can sign into it via Twitter or Google you find the apps that you want to um, track and then follow the feed in any RSS feed reader of your choice. And then you get notifications when apps are updated. So um, he's got great inf instructions there on how to use it. I mean, bravo. Good job. Bravo. I love seeing empowered all about Android uh, yeah, know, audience right? members. Build, you want something? Go build it. Um, I, so I guess really the, the, the next uh, challenge uh, for Rami is to 
make this into an Android app. Right? Yeah, I like the one thing that I that I see looking at this is it's cool what it does. The the adding um, adding apps to track is a little cumbersome in the sense that you have to go to the Play Store on a browser, copy the URL into the thing, mm-hmm. and then that actually uh, in turn kind of creates the RSS feed right. that's then loaded into your reader. So that could be if you have a lot of apps that you're tracking, that could take a while yeah. to set up initially, but. Making that into an app of some sort or having some sort of way to read your list and automatically import those things. But this is a great this is a great start, and uh, I thought it was kind of a, a cool solution to a problem that, I mean, I've had before, but yeah. I've just never... I decided to code thought, a program yeah, to yeah. fix it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I just love, I, like I said, I just love that. Like, I have a problem. I'm going to go out there and yeah. solve it. And and so, you know, Rami, I don't know what kind of developer you are, but, you know, if you want to take our challenge, you know, learn how to make turns to it. It would be great to have this as an Android app and get the notifications on your phone, not have to rely on the RSS feed. But maybe you don't know um, how to develop for an Android app. So maybe another all about Android community mm-hmm. member might want to raise their hand and say, I'll help you build that. So, you know, yeah, we'll, and- we'll let you guys find each other on the internet. <laughs> right. be amazed. By it. It'll be uh, magical. Uh, We've actually talked about something similar to this in the past because Eileen complained episodes and episodes ago uh, about um, not knowing what the change log is for every app. And yeah. I, I know that we found some sort of app that that catalogs those change logs, but it doesn't give you as much control over it as this. Like one thing that this does that I don't think that one did mm-hmm. is this would allow you to track apps that you don't have installed. Oh yeah, I mean, and that's you know, and, and that's, that's kind of that's kind of a big one. And that's the real key from his email that he mentioned was that you know, hey, here's an app that I'm keeping an eye on, mm-hmm. but I want to. I, I think a price update is really interesting because you yeah, know you see an app that does that, happen. Yeah, pretty... you see an app for sale for three ninety nine, and then it goes on sale for free or something like that. So I think that's that's really compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the ability to um, to like I finished a game, but I want more. I would like to go back to that game, but I don't want to keep the game on my phone. The, sure. the, the, that idea, the expanding levels. I mean, it is, it is a real need, and honestly, I'm surprised that uh, there's not an Android developer who has developed an Android app that does this yet. Mm-hmm. And again, maybe there's somebody in the audience who will um, take take it to task and do it. But um, that's a, that's a need I didn't even think about. Now that I think mm-hmm. about it, that's something I would totally use. Yep. So. Yeah. You got it. Well, thanks for sending that in, Rami. That's uh, really cool. Uh, and it is app, appfeed.net. There we go. All right. Let's, uh, let's dive into an Android arena. How about that? To enter, one lives the Android arena. Yeah. So... I've got to say, before my ritual, as we prepare for all about Android, when I'm not stuck in traffic, my ritual is to I review our the stories we're going to talk about, and I always the last thing I like to do is let's just go check in on last week's arena just to see if I'm prepared. Oh boy! And oh. I got to admit, this week I was shocked. Yeah? I thought for sure that I was rooting for. Admittedly, I was rooting for Eileen's app, mm-hmm. um, but I thought that uh, that Twitter app the, uh, slices that we saw from our guest last week would would, would edge mm-hmm. it out. Jessica Dolcourt. The mm-hmm. yeah, Jessica. That was that was like, that's a great app. I've been playing with it on my tablet. I went to look at the results. The man. <sighs> Kaboom. Uh, well, you know, I am shocked. Got a lot of people on Twitter, and you know that that voted on the poll that you can comment on the pages at Go Poll Go. So that's always kind of cool. Uh, saying like this is a really like hard arena. All the apps were pretty, except except mine was a lemon. <laughs> you just, Get it? Oh, it like, was a lemon. Oh, I, guess, was. I guess so. I mean, so <laughs> it's still got fifty-six votes. votes yeah, see, yeah, see, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Six axis controller won with forty-two percent of the votes. Slices Jessica's Twitter uh, app at thirty percent, second place. Song Pop third place, eighteen percent, and Lemon Wallet came in fourth at ten percent. But I, uh, I guess I under underest- a lot of good apps. I guess I underestimated the no- a the number of people. I I always underestimate the number of people who are gaming on their phones or on their tablets, mainly because I'm not a gamer. I think that's that. I think that that's a precedent that we've already set. Mm-hmm. But I totally underestimated the number of people that would want to attach a, <laughs> the six axis controller to their phone to use it. So I'm impressed. Totally. I was geeking out over it. I mean, I was looking yeah. at it, going, I I'd use that right now. Please mm-hmm. hand it over. I add that clip, and then you're that's all right. set. Yeah, that's exactly. Just, yeah, well, it's know. just it's also kind of cool to be able to take something you have lying around that maybe you're not using very much yep. and suddenly it, it you know brings new use to something that repurposing you tech yeah, Recycling yeah that's very Absolutely. very cool that's yeah. very very cool and i want to be a more of a gamer it's like i was i used to be such a gamer it's like i used to be a yeah. big pc yeah, gamer no, me too and all that stuff yep. it just as you get older and it's time just, oh, it's all time, time. yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> i just can't find much time for gaming these yeah, days yeah. as much as i try it never yeah. seems to stick around for me yeah. uh so then ron that means that you are up first i am up first and um uh, this week on the the arena, um, I was actually uh, 
as I was flying back to San Francisco this weekend, um, I was thinking about – I tend to travel a lot. Um, I know I talk about it a lot. I like to fly. Um, I believe there are a lot of folks out there also enjoy travel, whether it's for vacation or for business or for whatever. Um, I know there are, there are a lot of uh, plane nerds and plane hobbyists. Uh, I've worked with a couple in the past and things like that. Um, I was delighted to see – to discover that there is an app that has taken the data and functionality of an application that I actually use on the web and has brought it to the phone. Um, and it's from the folks at TripAdvisor, which are in a, a well-known, established kind of travel um, uh, resource website online. Um, and the app is called Seat Guru. Guru. So now I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break down what this app does and what the application actually does, and then show it to you because it's got way more than what I just tell it. But basically, if you fly a lot, and if you're on long-term, like long-term, but long-distance flights, if you're yeah, ever flying. To, I don't know, San Francisco to London or New York to Sydney or to Japan or anything like that. Where you sit is the make or break between driving you nuts for 14 hours mm -hmm. or having a pleasant voyage. Absolutely. And what I discovered when I discovered Seat Guru is that, thankfully, the internet has collected all the information out there that we could ever want. And I can now look up by airline, by flight, by plane, all these different dimensions and find out what is the best seat on that flight. And make sure I book that seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've used it a lot in the past. And now that it's on my phone, it is great because I've actually used it. I've had to change a flight in the airport. I'm like, all right, well, let me see what seat I'm going to get. I actually was flying back from, from – I was going – from Florida in July back to San Francisco and they wanted to change my seat and I said hold on a second I checked I was like okay yeah that's cool um, so let me show you the app let me show you what it does um, so if we dive right in here you can see and I'm sorry I didn't my phone's all smudgy um, you can see that once you load Seat Guru um, you've got kind of three options that you can do you can get seat map advice shop for flights or get a flight status so I'm going to go to the seat map advice that's our kind of main thing and basically what you can do is you can search by uh, flight number. So if you know that, okay, listen, I've got to go to New York and I'm going on JetBlue flight number 185. Um, I want to make, you know, I want to check all the, the, the seats on that plane. You can search that way. Um, or you can search by route. So, you know, okay, I'm going, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to fly American Airlines. I'm going to go from, you know, New York to LA. What are this? What, and on this day, what are the planes that are running that way? Or you can search by airline, which is really cool because if you are a plane nerd, like some folks who um, uh, who are, some airlines have different model planes. Some some you know like the JetBlue is all Airbuses and that sort of thing. So you can scroll and you can find your you, you can find your uh, preferred airline. I'm going to go to American Airlines because I know they have a large fleet. And what's fascinating, you may not notice this when you when you book, but primarily also when you when you book, I don't know so much about the aggregators like Expedia and things like that, but when you book on um, a lot of the uh, airlines direct websites, they will tell you the model plane you're flying on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, if you're going from San Francisco to London, really long flight, and you know it's going to tell you that it's on a Boeing uh, 737-800-738, you can click that. Or oh, tap it. Sorry. So yeah. click. <laughs> um, you can tap it, and it will load a map of the plane, and it will easily color code to you where the good and the bad seats are. Okay? So if there's no color code, it's just that's just an average seat. I'm, I can tap on that, and it will tell me this whole block of seats is going to say, you know, seats 17 through 19 are standard economy seats, No bit, nothing big there. Okay, so I know, I know what I'm getting when I sit here. But, you know, I'm like, oh, well, you know, these are red. Why is this red? So I'm going to click on this one here. Well, not the yellow one, the red one. There you go. And it's going to tell me that seat 14F has extra leg room but no recline. The window side armrest is attached to the wall, which may be uncomfortable. The tray table is in the armrest, making it immovable. It can get very cold by the exit during the flight. Oh, that's the worst part. That this I've on sat, a long flight. I've sat in this seat horrible. on a flight to London. Mm. It's the worst seat on the plane. Yeah. It is. It is. It's miserable. Mm -hmm. Um. So then, all right, well, let me. what are these green ones? Let me, it's going to tell me these. So these seats in row 15 have extra leg room. The tray tables are in the armrest, making the armrest immovable and reducing the already tight seat width. So they're, they're better seats, but they're a little dangerous because you don't have much width. So it allows you to make more educated decisions about where you're actually going to sit on the dang flight, um, which is kind of invaluable. But – if that's all the app did, it would be a little useless. Not useless, but a little, a little silly. But so luckily, the, the Seat Guru folks, they also put in their flight search tools um, as well as flight status tools. So if you're an active flyer, this app then becomes your go-to app to check you know, your flight status or to even nice. search for flights to go from there. So it's a little extra functionality. Um, it's free. It's informative. And you know, quite honestly, I'll get lost for about a half an hour just browsing uh, plane layouts and finding good seats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it also becomes a, a thing because a lot of, you know, as planes are getting more and more technical 
technologically advanced, you find out you find out what specific flights have Wi-Fi on board, yep. which ones have AC outlets on board, um, where they are. Like for example, I was on a flight once, and I was on an American flight, and American has AC outlets, but like every five rows, at least on this plane, and you want to like, know which row exactly, it is, exactly. So yeah, get it. so so yeah. it takes the guesswork out of out of your booking your flight, which is you know which honestly can be the difference maker between having starting out a good trip or having a miserable time. So, right. so I mean, I I fly for a living. I'm yeah. in the plane more than I'm not. And uh, I mean, this is something that I, I just downloaded it. So there you I'm, go. I'm, I'm voting for you. Oh, uh, thank you. Sea Guru is awesome. Yeah. Like on the web, I I mean, I'm incredibly well, tall, I, so was, I need it. That was <laughs> like, the use case seriously. I totally forgot. If you're, if you're incredibly tall, you want yeah. to know how much leg room you have. Yes. If you're, you know, like depending on your weight and all this sort of stuff, there are all these different factors. Everybody has different requirements when they fly. You know, mm-hmm. and and um, it's always good to know how close it is to the bathroom. You know, like mm-hmm. all those sort of things. I have had some wonderful flights, some wonderful um, transcontinental flights, thanks to Seat Guru because I got the good seat. So cool, yep. Seat Guru, the app. It's get free. It. Um, I'm definitely going to get that. Although I wish I flew more to put it to use more, but. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm starting to think I have a problem. Indispensable. I'm starting to think that it's it's, it's a problem. It's, <laughs> the first yeah. step is to admit it. Yeah, I know. Yes, yeah, exactly. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, but. all right, cool. Uh, Father Robert, you are up next. What you got? Yeah. So um, this is actually an extension off of a story that was covered by Twit, I believe, a week ago, or maybe even two weeks ago. It was Matt Honan, and what happened was his uh, he had his accounts linked on his iPad, his iPhone, and his MacBook Air. And deletion of one basically wiped them all out. I mean, he was hacked, but it could be that if you accidentally delete a file on one of your devices, that sync will be propagated yeah. to everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, what I've been trying to tell a lot of my users has been synchronization is not backup. Synchronization is for utility. It's for ease of use. But you still need a backup. And so, yep. I mean, th- my program, is, my app is a sacrificial lamb. It's not going to win. I don't want it to win. What I want it to do is I want people to actually download it and use it. It's called a click-free automatic backup. Now, anyone who has used one of their hard drives before knows click-free. They're this company that specializes in these uh, idiot-proof backup devices. You basically plug them in, it runs the software, and it goes. It's the same idea with here. We've got an application that gives you the ability to back up pretty much any, any document you may have, any, any programs you might have running in your, in your tablet. Um, so you can choose your photos, your music, your videos, documents, applications, et cetera, et cetera. You get to choose the parts of the tablet that you think need to be backed up, and then you get to choose where you're going to back it up. Now, here's the cool part. I can back it up to Dropbox, Skybox, Box, basically anywhere in the cloud. Google Drive. Google Drive or this device. I can actually tell it to use the, uh, the SD card that I have built into this so I can pull the SD card out and have a complete backup of everything, not just the sync files, but my applications. So if I ever need to reset this to factory, I pop the SD card back in, I reload the click-free app, one one click, and boom, it goes back to the way it was. Uh, now, what I really like about this device, about, about this app, is that it's smart enough to uh, to understand when you're trying to do a backup and, uh, you know, when you're just trying to get files on and off of, uh, of your device. So it, it will... It will uh, help you to to trim and par your backup file list it will help you to uh, parse your your actual backup file it's uh it's it's actually quite intelligent now backing up isn't sexy it's not fun but if uh, if as Pretty you important. have it yeah exactly yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I had a tablet uh, we'll call it a tablet failure what really happened was i left a tablet on top of a, a car um, wow. Yeah, it's it, a failure it, on some level. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was failed. <laughs> it was fail. Uh, but because I had backed it up, I actually took the SD card out of the tablet, plugged it into the uh, the replacement tablet, and boom, everything was back. Can we back up and wow. talk about the tablet on the car? What? So did you drive away? Did it bow, Did it go flying? Or? I actually didn't drive away. I yeah. left it on top of the car, and someone else drove away. <laughs> okay. Oh, Were you in the car? I was not in the car. So you watched it happen? I was. I was turn, as I heard the engine revving, oh, I turned around, and it was... No. I totally had one of those. I, so, part of my I, this is a story, but we're 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 running okay on time. Yeah, we're um, doing all right. So, in July, I was actually at Disney World with my family, and um, and got off of Space Mountain, and I was wearing shorts, and I had my phone, and the phone slid right out, and I got off the ride, 
And I did my usual, like, okay, go to the phone to go tweet about the fact that I just went on Space Mountain, and the phone wasn't there. And I and I watched the car, the the ride thing go in the way, and I went no. <laughs> and so I, I quickly shouted to the to the girl, and and I said my phone's in there. And so she called and called ahead to the next spot, and they grabbed it before people got oh, on the ride. Oh. And it was this close to falling out on Space Mountain. So, oh, yeah, okay. so anyway, but yeah, so I share your pain. Exactly. <laughs> Although I recovered it, but right. wow, that's oh, that's, I once left my sunglasses on top of my car. <laughs> oh, and that's a total yeah. That's it's not nearly as disastrous. I got to say, though, for not wanting, you know, saying you don't want this app to win or something, that's a pretty handy app. Yeah. It's a very handy yeah. app. And that's, that's why, you know, but yeah. I, I say, you know, because I, I, I like the app. I, I want people to use the app, but yeah. I don't care if it wins as long as people download it. Yeah. That's, that's the... That's what the arena is all that's, about. That's the, all the, about. the true meaning of the yes. arena, Jason. This is, this is a gr- it's not about winning. It's about bringing <laughs> cool apps to yeah, exactly. you got to turn the other screen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's awesome. So that's click-free automatic backup, and it's free. It's free. Love it. Awesome. Cool. All right. Very two cool. very useful apps. Now mine is not useful at all. No, not true. <laughs> mine is useful, but I feel like this is this is one, one of those apps that uh, a certain – a certain you know few people are going to be like, yes, I totally need that. And everybody else is going to be like, oh, yeah, that's okay. It's called Insta Wi-Fi. And basically what it does is it works with both NFC or you can also use QR code. And it's an app that when you install it, it allows you to do a few things. So I'll go ahead and show you right now. I'll launch Insta Wi-Fi here. So this is Insta Wi-Fi. It's in NFC mode right now. I have this little NFC tag. There we go. You can see it. Oh, cool. I'll go ahead and put it back there. And what you can see on the screen is, oh, it's already connected. Okay. What you can see is an SSID for, oh, it just it totally zapped what was on the uh, NFC tag. We'll remove that for a second. It has the SSID for all of the different Wi-Fi access points I have in my phone. What I can do is I can write to this NFC tag the Wi-Fi credentials. And the cool no. thing about this That's is that cool. when, like, the way, the reason I thought this would be kind of useful is, you know, I have people come over to my house and they automatically ask you, like, how, uh, what's your Wi-Fi access point? What's your password? And I have to, you know, tell them it's a long password and I have to make sure that they do it right or whatever. So in this case, what I can do is I can write it to an NFC tag. And the downside is you have to have Insta Wi-Fi installed in order to okay. read it, right? But if you don't have Insta Wi-Fi installed and you put it up with NFC, it launches the Play Store and oh, you, know, okay. you can that's download clever. it. That's clever. Yeah. So it, it brings you right there. But So that's one way that you can do it. I can put this up here. I can write to tag. I'll show you. So write you can, to tag. you're writing the, the information to that tag. That's I just wrote Twit Office. Um, that's so cool. ID and password to the tag, right? And I can show you how that works then. So let's go out here. Make sure that my Wi-Fi is off. I'm going to go to my mobile networks here. And uh, let's see here. So that was for Office, right? I have to turn it on in order to forget Office here. Let's see here. So Office, I'm going to go ahead and forget that. Forget the network. So it's no longer in my list. I'll turn it off. And then now, oh, there we go. So now if I put this up here, scanning, associating, connected. And it'll turn on Wi-Fi, it. and I'm now connected to that Wi-Fi access point. That is super that cool. That is very cool. And that is super cool. Very, you, very cool. You can just program it into a little um, NFC tag. Uh, I could also beam it to you. Okay. So, you know, there's that as well with NFC. And the other cool thing, of course, is that if I launch it here, and, we, and you know, the person that's over doesn't have NFC, all you have to do is go into QR mode. It cool. gives you the QR oh. code. For the Wi-Fi, so as long as they have some sort of a scanning app, all they have to do is scan that, and that's all they need. They don't actually need Insta Wi-Fi installed on their phone. They just have to have a, a scanner that, that that's is capable cool. of doing QR I'm, codes. I'm totally geeking out over that. Yeah. That's So uh, it's just a way to make it a little – it's like the the, simp, the stupidest thing to be like, I want to make it easy for people that visit my house to get on my Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it couldn't be – it doesn't have to be limited to that. But it's a very kind of specific use case app. It's called Insta Wi-Fi. Um, and I will say I also came across a post – by the developer of this on his site, and I'll include it in, in our show notes at twit.tv slash AAA72 for the episode number. And he did, and developers in particular might find this interesting, he did a post hoc, what he calls a post hoc analysis of how he launched Insta Wi Fi. It was his first app that he's ever developed for Android. And he just kind of created a, a really nice detailed article about what worked and how he launched the app and what, you know, wasn't so successful. He found that not many people, you know, got 
to his app through his website, but having a, a YouTube video that's less than three minutes and associating yeah. that with your Play Store, it's just a really kind of a good kind of interesting insight into one developer's kind of launch of their app, and maybe other developers can read through it and kind of learn a few things from it. That's, I mean, but, that's cool from a resource standpoint. Yeah. But that app, like that, that just thinking about that concept makes me wonder. Like that's the kind of thing Google sh should roll into the operating right. system. Isn't it right? interesting Isn't because it? Yeah, we were yeah. kind of talking about that a little bit earlier. I think uh, yeah. Justin Robert Young is here for NSFW yeah. later on tonight, and that's exactly what he asked. He's like, why isn't this kind why, of just part of it the, to begin with? And then why isn't it already <laughs> part of it? Why don't I have NFC in my laptop? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because how I mean, honestly, how great would it be to just to just you know hover your laptop close to something and be able to you know getting nods in the audience? Thank yeah. you, sir. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and be able to connect to the Wi-Fi. I mean, like that. Yeah. You know, like it, see, the, totally. the hooks are there though yeah. because if you take the Nexus Seven and you hover it over the uh, the queue, yeah, it will become the remote control. So right, the hooks yeah. are built in there. It's just Google has to let developers use them. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Unless the queue doesn't do anything other <laughs> yeah. than that. So. <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah, but um, that <laughs> Jason, that is that's a very uh, a very small but formidable app. I'm impressed. Totally, it is. And totally. I, wa I want to get one of these uh, NFC tags. Where do you get those? Well, this is well, this is a Samsung tech yeah. tile. It's yeah. Samsung's kind of proprietary. Well, it's not even proprietary because it's just NFC. It's yeah. just an NFC tag. I just and overrode it with the Insta Wi-Fi. Right, thing. No, I kind of want. But get... yeah, we had it hanging out around Nicole Lee. I asked yeah. around the office if anyone had one so I could demonstrate. This, but I kind of want to get a bunch of this, and I just want to start writing NFC tags and putting them all over. Well, okay, it's yeah. Yeah. actually, yeah. actually. So check this out. The developer has said it's a free app. He has a donate button in the app. If you donate, he will send you NFC tags. Ooh, cool. Okay. Even better. Wow. So that's check awesome. it out. I don't know if that's a short term thing, yeah. but um, definitely check it out. You can donate. I think two dollars or four dollars or whatever. And yeah. he has like a a bunch of NFC tags, and I don't know exactly how many he's giving, but um, you know. We'll give you a couple, and you can program them. And then when people visit, and they can hop on your Wi-Fi. And also, um, uh, Jonathan SCE in the chat room uh, let us know about TagStand.com, which appears to be an NFC card uh, uh, provider, NFC tag provider. Oh, okay. So you can so for fifteen bucks, you can get a NFC hobbyist starter kit that gets you fifteen stickers. So a buck go. a sticker, not buck too a bad. sticker. That's not too Thanks. bad. So thank you for that chat room, Jonathan. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Radical. So, All right, yeah. so that is Insta Wi-Fi. Uh, we also have Ron's Seat Guru app, free. And then, Father Robert, you had click-free automatic backup. Uh, three very useful apps this wow. week around. I love useful. I know all about Android. I love. Here. I love it when the arena kind of follow, falls into this unplanned kind of. Theme. So uh, next next week is all fart apps. Basically. Yep. Okay. Got it. Basically. Sweet. Yes. No. Next week are all the apps that are like I'm so rich that are like two hundred dollars. <laughs> so we each have to buy one all paid. and review those. Okay. okay. That's the plan. okay. All right. Well, you can vote on your favorite app this week by going to bit.ly slash aaa poll seven two bit.ly slash aaa poll 72 let us know which is your favorite app is it seat guru click free automatic backup or insta wi-fi insta wi-fi is running our way with it the early what? lead really mm -hmm. yeah i'm telling you man that's a functional functional app uh, it's that's still a pretty cool. close race there though that's cool between click free automatic backup and insta wi-fi right now yeah. i can see this going any way and seat guru is just it's such just a useful yeah I mean, the thing is, see, see Guru, you got it. You have to be a traveler. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Right, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if if or if, a plain nut, a plain or nut. a plain nut. Yeah, exactly. Actually, one of the things about Seat Guru, Guru that I really liked is there are some seats that you think would be good yep. that are not. Like the the ones right next to exit rows, you think you get more leg room. They don't. Yeah. Right. yeah, or or the, the oh, or yeah. the fact that the the row in front Probably of it behind it. it doesn't recline, right? That, that just, or, or it knows what the entertainment systems are, and so it's blocking off your feet. What I thought, you, what I thought was really interesting, I was looking. I forgot which plane model it was, but, but but earlier when I was going through and I was prepping my demo, I found a plane where there was one random seat that was um, red, and like it was it was kind of like and it was nowhere near anything. I was like, what is this? And then like. Like every seat on this plane reclines the Except seat. That this, one. This, no, the seat normally slides forward as it reclines. So instead of inst it, it goes like this, right? Oh, right. So do you get so the seat kind of reclines right, forward. Right. This one seat in this one row only reclines back. Uh, and so therefore, if you're in it, the person in front of you is going to get a little lower. Yeah. And so like, <laughs> and so I was like, oh wow, I will never sit in that seat ever. Yeah. And like, it's just one seat. And so it's just fascinating. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. And and it's all it's from what I understand, it's all not all, but majority crowdsourced by other plane nuts who right. who know what flight they're on, what plane they're on, and this is the experience I had. And the you know, and so it's it's when it gets down to the the, the individual flight route and plane number, that's when. It's 
that's fascinating. Yeah. You know the exact plane there's a problem with that seat. I, I always want to make sure that the seat in front of me doesn't recline. Because yeah. if it does, yeah. I'm a dead man on exactly. a plane. There was, there was, there, there was I always another... break the seat in front of me. It's really yeah. easy. Just jam something in the gear. It's done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, I need, I need to do yeah. there, there was another couple seats where it identified when there was um, partial windows or no windows. So it depended. You know, mm-hmm. Sometimes some planes, the way it goes. It's, just, I, it's fascinating. It's cool. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm a dork. We're all dorks here. We're That's united we're in our dorkitude. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Uh, bit.oy slash AAA poll 72. Go vote. And that is it for this week. We kind of cruised through this episode. We really did. Somehow. I was kind of <laughs> well, last week's was a little bit long, so we're making up for that, I but guess, right What now. has changed about this episode and last episode? I mean. I think I think hmm. there's, yeah, well, wait, wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I think mm. I think the magnet in that stand is affecting us. Yeah, I think the magnet. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's it is. That's gotta be what it is. Yeah. The magnet. Uh, Father Robert, it's awesome having you on the show. Thanks I'm, for having I'm me on. Stoked to have you on and that you agreed to do this and uh, jump into the fire with us. Um, <laughs> it's warm. Yes. Uh, go ahead and plug anything that you'd like to plug. Uh, the floor the is thing yours. I want to plug is uh, Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech. I mean, if you're cool. a geek, you don't have to be an enterprise geek, but if you're a geek and you like knowing how the world is connected, we film every Monday at 12 noon PDT. And if you come, you can jump into the chat room, and I regularly take questions and integrate those into the content. I believe this, uh, this coming Monday we're going to be talking a little bit about um, – uh, what it's like to travel in a hostile country mm-hmm. with sensitive data. So it's a little bit of spyish espionage. It'll, it'll be mm-hmm. fun. Cool. Stop by, say hi, scream out in the chat room, and uh, keep quiet. Excellent. I'll have to uh, remember to get some Spy Hunter music for that segment. I'll see if I can work on that. Uh, Ron, go ahead and plug. Uh, yes, you can go to about.me slash ronxo and you can find all links to me on Twitter and uh, Google Plus and Facebook and all that fun stuff. Um, and check out graphically.com and ifanboy.com where I spend my days. Yay, yeah, yes. Woot. You do that. I and do. you can find me, uh, I am at Jason Howell on Twitter, about.me slash Jason Howell, and everywhere else is Raygun01. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense, but that's the way it is. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Leave us a voicemail. Uh, you can reach us at 347-SHOW-AAA. You can send us an email or give us a video mail with a link to that uh, to the video mail in an email to AAA at twit.tv. You can find our show on Twitter. We are at Android Show. You can always find our show notes at twit.tv slash AAA. The full show notes right as the episode is posted. Look for that tonight. Uh, past episodes are also available on our site. You can also find those on iTunes, YouTube, all over the place. Finally, you can catch us live every Tuesday starting at 5 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on another episode of All About Android. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam This is high quality entertainment, folks. And it's all over. I'm not going to see anything more. There's nothing more. Ah! I was wrong. I was so wrong. <laughs> this week on Dancing with Ozzy. <laughs>